Welcome to Burlington. You are visiting a town once called Flint Hills, Orchard City, and Porkopolis. Burlington was opened to European settlement in 1833. It was soon renamed Burlington after Burlington, Vermont. Burlington was the second capital of the Wisconsin Territory from 1837 to 1838 and the first capital of the Iowa Territory, 1838 to 1840. Burlington became the mercantile and distribution center for the settlers westbound. Its geographic location on the Mississippi River and the available lumber slash coal made it a great place to manufacture the items needed for people moving westbound. It was the point of origin for steamboat, railroad, and wagon wheel traffic going westbound. We will be exploring the southern part of Burlington, beginning at the Municipal River Terminal, which was once a distribution point for all. We begin at the Burlington Welcome Center. This riverfront building was dedicated in October of 1928. In the beginning, it was a warehouse, a floating dock that connected riverboat traffic with a place to offload cargo in Burlington, Iowa. Currently, this building is being utilized as Iowa's official welcome center for visitors coming by highway from the east. Ample trackage is provided for loading and unloading 10 railway cars on a single track. And by using portable runway, unloading can be done from four tracks at once. Two industrial tractors are used in moving freight from the dock to the warehouse. This was what it was used for when it was a river terminal. As we move forward, we are going toward the west on Washington Street until reaching Snake Alley. Snake Alley was built in 1894 as a shortcut to the downtown area from North Hill. It consists of five half curves, two quarter turns, stretches 275 feet over a rise of 58 feet. Bricks are laid sideways for better mobility of horses and wagons loads moving up and down the alley. The curbs are limestone which was queried on the North Hill. The bricks and curbing is original. The street was relayed in 1972. We are now leaving Snake Alley and going toward South Hill. We will be crossing the Six River Viaduct on our way to a beautiful park. South Hill Park is between 6th, 7th, and Etna and Elm Street. South Hill was the second public square marked on the original survey. Near the corner of Elm and 7th is a boulder monument marking a solar eclipse event viewed here August the 7th, 1869. Many well-known scientists from all over the globe gathered in Burlington for this event. Bricks for the first brick house in Iowa were made near the southeast corner of this park. There are great views of Burlington and northeastern Mississippi from South Hill Park. The Palmer House is currently the Candlelight Manor bed and breakfast. The Candlelight Manor with its superb river views, recaptures the antebellum charm of a more gracious time. The house's first occupant was the Palmer family. Luke Palmer Sr. in 1839 made his way to Burlington. He was a carpenter that turned his attentions to merchandising from 1839 to 1850. He owned business initially on Main Street and later partnered with Hedge and Rand on a building at Jefferson and Third. Luke Palmer and his whole family are buried at Aspen Grove. From the Palmer House we were turning uh, east on Elm to the depot. The Burlington Railroad Depot was constructed in 1944. At one time, it had a gold leaf letter 30 inches high spelling out Burlington, once filled the eastern exit wall of the building. The depot waiting room ceiling is 24 feet high, with windows measuring 20 and a half feet by 17. At one time, nine different railroad companies loaded and unloaded passengers here. The famous Zephyr was built here and ran here 
both north and south, east and west. Currently, daily service by Amtrak stops here for passengers going from Chicago to Sacramento, California. We continue our tour southbound on Maine, passing Kelly O'Shea's Shamrock Pub and the Dairy Queen, and stopping at the Hawkeye. The Hawkeye newspaper traces its roots to the Wisconsin Territorial Gazette and the Burlington Advertiser, which was established July the 10th, 1837 by James Clark and Cyrus Jacobs. Clark and Jacobs moved to Burlington from Belmont, Wisconsin, when the capital of the Wisconsin Territory was moved to Burlington. The pair did printing work for the territorial government and were aligned with the Democratic Party in 1838. A separate Iowa Territory was created, and Burlington was named its first capital. The paper located on Main Street from 1839 until 1958. In 1959, the newspaper relocated to a renovated bus barn at 800 South Main Street, where it continues to publish. At the time of the move, the paper added a Sunday edition. The newspaper plant overlooks the BNSF rail yards and is close proximity to the Mississippi River. We will continue our journey on Maine uh, from the Hawkeye toward Polk Street or Prospect Hill and stop at the view the River Bridge. The Railroad River Bridge was instituted in October 1865 the CB&Q Board of Directors committed the railroad to building the Burlington River Bridge before then. Federal authorization was granted on July 25, 1866. Work did not actually commence until July 30, 1867. An excursion train with 10 cars came from Galesburg just across the bridge to show what that bridge would do. During the day, the bridge was photographed by Mr. Mumford Hill. This was on August the 20th, 1867. August the 23rd, 1867, the bridge was officially opened. Construction of the bridge cost $1,227,892. The length of the bridge as originally constructed was six spans, 250 feet long. The total length is 2,394 and a half feet. The bridge is supported on limestone piers of solid masonry, seven feet wide and 23 feet long at the top and 18 feet wide, 55 feet long at the bottom. We continue our journey down South Main to 100 Polk Street. George B. Carpenter House. This house was built for George P. Carpenter, a jewelry merchant, in 1878. Mr. Carpenter owned a jewelry business with his brother, A.W. Carpenter, at 3rd and Jefferson. The house is a high Victorian Gothic style with Swiss influence and was designed by a Burlington architect, Mr. Dunham. After Mr. Carpenter's death, it was sold to Frank Millard in 1881. The Millard family still owns this house today. After we leave the Carpenter house at 100 Polk, we will be going west for a short span to the alleyway and then across the alleyway south to Clay Street and going east to the Starker Leopold houses. At about 111 Clay is the Starker Leopold Historic District, and it's composed of three houses and the surrounding grounds overlooking the Mississippi River in Burlington, Iowa. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1983. The houses were built by the Starker Leopold family who lived in them for most of their existence. Charles Starker was a successful Burlington businessman who contributed to public building and park development projects. 
He worked as an architect, engineer, and merchant before becoming an influential banker. His daughter, Clara Starker Leopold, instilled her father's values in her children. Carl Leopold was Clara's husband and a local woodworking businessman and outdoor enthusiast. The grounds on which the houses were built is divided into three distinct properties, but the lawn areas are open to each other and feature interior sidewalks that serve a central located garage. The Charles Starker House, 101 Clay, is a large Italianate frame house that was built sometime between 1868 and 1874. An extensive Georgian revival porch was added around 1907. It is built on limestone block foundation. The Clay Aldo Leopold House at 111 Clay is a two and a half story rustic Queen Anne style residence built around 1893. It features a multiple gable roof and a central chimney. The foundation and first floor of the house are composed of rough-faced cut limestone that was laid in a random manner. By the 1930s, Leopold was the country's top expert on wildlife management. Leopold saw wilderness as more than a game or recreation hunting ground, but as an arena for the flourishing of a healthy biotech community. He fought for efforts to expand and protect the nation's wildlife areas whilst changing society's attitude toward nature. We will be leaving 111 Clay, uh, the Alto Leopold House, moving southbound to 1618 River Road, the Churchill House. The Churchill House is a beautiful modern home nestled on the banks of the Mississippi with a commanding view north and south of the Mississippi. As you can see from the pictures, it has an English Tudor study. Much of the structure for this room was imported from England. The family that built this house was significant to the growth of Burlington in the early 1900s. F.S. Churchill built Churchill's Drug as a wholesale distributor in 1915, they had over 32 salesmen that covered the Midwest. In 1921, they had branches in Cedar Rapids and Peoria. In 1928, they merged with McKesson and Robbins to form McKesson Churchill Drug Company. In 1940, they became McKesson and Robbins Drug Company. We moved from the Churchill House at 618 River Road to the Pauley House, which is at 2636 South Main. P.E. Pauley's house was the first house built to tend vineyards that covered his land on Cascade Terrace. Mr. Pauley came here from Germany. He was a vine grower in Germany. Vineyards like Federal Bond Winery, Concord Vineyards used this land from the mid-1800s to the 1930s to grow grapes for wines. Mr. Polly has a wine cellar under his house. Many of the homes in Burlington in the late 1800s had wine cellars. Cascade Terrace later became a high-end housing development. Next we will journey from 2336 South Main, the Polly House, to 13 Cascade Terrace, the Pettigrew House. The Pettigrew House at 13 Cascade Terrace is perched upon the edge of a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. It was occupied in 1911 by the Pettigrews that came to Burlington as assistant to the president of the Burlington Hotel. On April 1, 1918, Mr. Pettigrew purchased the Burlington Hotel at the age of 29. Mr. Pettigrew then became the manager of this well-known and prospering establishment. Before long, Mr. Pettigrew had increased his holdings. He added the Union Hotel in Burlington to his holdings in 1937, and in 1940 he bought the Hawkeye Hotel in the same city. Pettigrew also made his mark in the automobile retailing business. In 1943, he opened an agency selling Ozenbeels with Mr. Bormeyer and was instrumental in erecting the building which houses this agency. In 1946, he bought a Lincoln Mercury dealership. On February the 16th, 1911, Robert E. 
Pettigrew married Robert E. Frederick, Ruthie Frederick, the daughter of Henry and Emily Frederick. The house is 5,102 square feet, not counting the finished basement, screened-in porch, and outdoor patios. So there is a plenty of living space to spread out and relax in in this establishment. We leave Mr. Pettigrew's house at 13 Cascade Terrace on our way to 2131 South Main, the Laga Messina house. Andy Laga Messina built this house at 2131 South Main. He was born in Genoa, Italy in 1841. As his Burlington friends called him, Andy. He traveled to the New World in 1866 to seek his fortune. This handsome young Italian lingered a while in New York where he married Maria Tassino. The couple and their offsprings drifted west to Wheeling and eventually settled in Burlington. Between his arrival in Burlington 1875 and his death 1907, Laga Messina built an ever-expanding retail and wholesale fruit business. By the first decade of the 20th century, Laga Messina Group Company operated branches, offices in Cedar Rapids, Creston, Davenport, Dubuque, Ottoma, and other towns like Esterville and St. Louis. He is also credited as being the man who introduced bananas to Burlington. The house has five Mabel fireplaces that were imported from the old country. At one time, the house had gas lights that were manufactured by Steuben. We're heading on our way from the Lago Messina house to Dankworth Park in the entrance on Madison. Dankworth Park is a 72-acre municipal park in the southeast section of Burlington, Iowa. It is located adjacent to Crapel Park and bordered by Shakakon Drive, South Main Street, and Madison Avenue. The park was established in 1937 on land donated to the city by Lyda Dankworth as a memorial to her family. Dankworth Park hosts numerous recreational opportunities including Disc golf course, swimming pool, tennis courts, shelter house, a skate park, and more. As we leave Dankworth Park, we will be entering Crapo Park. And first we'll look at the lookout where guns are, the Hawkeye Native Cabin, the fountain where Crapo Park is, the Shakespeare Garden, Lake Starker, and the course statue. At the east entrance of Crapo Park are guns. And the history of these guns is a three inch uh, 50 caliber gun dates to 1958 when the former Iowa Congressman Fred Swingle dedicated the cannons at the park. Details about how the retired naval guns were used before becoming park decorations are sketchy but they weren't the first guns stationed in the park. Burlington businessman and philanthropist Philip Crapo donated two 100-pound Parrot guns from the Civil War to the park in 1896, the same kind of cannons used in the Civil War. Crapo helped establish the park to the previous year and bought the guns for Iowa's semi-centennial, which was celebrated in the park. Those cannons were turned into scrap metal in 1943 to help fight World War II, and Crapo Park was without military hardware for 15 years until the current 50 caliber guns were installed. To the right of the guns is the Hawkeye Native Cabin. This old pioneer log cabin was erected by the Hawkeye Native Society in 1910. On the rear porch overlooking the river is an old Indian dugout canoe. Within the cabin are relics of pioneer days. The rafters are made from lumber cut on the John Leyte farm north of Burlington, 
over a hundred years ago. We leave the log cabin and go past the bandstand up the hill to the fountain. The fountain in Crapo Park was commissioned by the WPA in 1937. It was in service September 1937. The fountain was dedicated to Charles Follinger, July 1952. Charles Follinger was the park superintendent from 1938 until his death in 1949. The fountain was originally controlled by vacuum tubes created by GE Electric. It was refurbished in 2003 with a computerized controller. The fountain displayed red, green, blue, and yellow lights. We leave the fountain in Crippo Park, <clears throat> moving toward the south, toward the Shakespeare Garden. The Shakespeare Garden contains almost every flower named in Shakespeare's works. An ivy sprig was taken from Shakespeare's grave in England and replanted here in this park. Dedicated in 1928, the garden was created and designed by the ladies of the Shakespeare Club. Many readings and Shakespeare plays have been presented here over time. We move now to the southwest from Shakespeare Garden to Lake Starker. In 1906, the members of the park board wanted to have a lake in the park. Those members were Mr. Ernest Bach, Theodore Rondolph, W.P. Foster, and William Pilger. Lake Starker at this time was a deep mud hole. A false bottom was put in early that spring. Uh, water was turned on. Lake Starker was formed 600 feet long, 300 feet wide. A large island was constructed in the center of the lake. At this time, pleasure boats were allowed on the lake. By 1924, ice skating on Lake Starker was allowed, and in later years, ice carnivals were held as Kiwanis projects. These ice carnivals attracted a lot of talent. Races were held around the island, while <clears throat> fancy skating events were held in special marked-off areas. The lake was named in honor of Charles Starker, one of the first park commissioner, planners, designers of the park. We leave Lake Starker and go s southwest on South Main to Brooks Avenue to where the Corse statue is. The Corse statue is a bronze statue which was erected in 1896 in Crapo Park to honor a Burlington Civil War hero, General John Corse. His distinguished war record included command of the 6th Iowa Infantry and the 2nd Division of the 16th Corps. He participated in the Battle of Shiloh and Corinth in Tennessee and Atlanta campaigns. After the fall of Atlanta in 1864, he was ordered to defend a supply depot at Altoona Pass, Georgia. When General Sherman heard Corse was there, he replied, Hold the fort, for I am coming. Corse was wounded during the battle, but his success became the subject of general order from General Sherman, which emphasized the necessity to defend a fortify posts to the last. The phrase, Hold the fort, inspired a hymn and was placed on the base of his statue which was the first equestrian statue erected in Iowa. We move now from the Crapo statue to the airport, going down Parkway to Summer Street, and then finally to the airport to the west. Burlington's airport was launched in 1929 when the Burlington City Council adopted a resolution to establish a municipal airport on an L-shaped 55-acre sod field on Summer Street in Burlington, Iowa. Regularly scheduled commercial passenger service started two years later in 1931 when the National Transportation Company added Burlington to its Chicago to Kansas City route. National's two Ford trimotor planes made two daily flights to Burlington carrying 10 passengers each and lumbering across the sky with a top speed of 152 miles per hour. In 1943, a contract was signed 
with the U.S. government to pave the runways and expand the site to 500 acres. Braniff Airlines began offering two daily departures to Kansas City to carry passengers and cargo in 1944. Three years later, in 1947, a long-range airport developed plan was created for building a Quonset Hut administration building, a U-shaped entrance road with parking, a gasoline service station for aircraft, a tourist court with recreational facilities, a maintenance building, and hangars for aircraft. The airport's hours of operation were extended in 1959 when runway lights were installed, enabling flights to take off and land at night. In 1967, an aviation easement was established, and the north-south runway was widened and extended to 1,351 feet. The terminal building was remodeled for the comfort of Burlington passengers in 1989. In 1996, the Burlington Regional Airport's name was changed to Southeast Iowa Regional Airport to reflect the entire area that we serve. Currently, the airport employs about 20 people who take the time to provide personal service to our customers. Passengers tell us that the laid-back, inviting atmosphere at our airport reminds them of Wings TV show. The airport is currently served by Air Choice One. It has daily flights to Minneapolis, Chicago, and St. Louis. As we leave the airport, we will be headed northbound to the Edward Stone School, which was named after a famed Edward Stone, the father of the Voyager. The Edward Stone School is named for famed physicist Edward Stone, who was on hand to help dedicate the new middle school named in his honor. Stone, who has ties to Burlington, said having a middle school named after him is an extraordinary honor. Quote, this is truly an honor because it comes from the community where my exploration journey began. Unquote. Stone uh, is a Burlington High School graduate, former director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, chief of the Voyager 1 and 2 projects, and namesake of Edward Stone's Middle School. As project scientist for the Voyager mission at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, Stone coordinated scientific studies of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, along with Voyager's continuing exploration of the outer heliostope, and the search of the interstellar space. The $18 million school opened its doors to students on August the 20th. Following this is a movie that gives you an update of the Voyager project. This is a Voyager mission control area. This is where we talk to our spacecraft. Hey, Scott, please grab the one that looks good. Tonight we're going to be getting the data back from a magnetometer roll calibration maneuver. And that maneuver actually happened on the Voyager 1 spacecraft more than 16 hours ago. But the data is finally making it back to the Earth. What we're doing is a roll about this high gain antenna. And so if the, if the high gain antenna here is pointed out toward the Earth, we're going to be rolling the spacecraft along that high gain antenna. That roll is done so that we can calibrate the instrument so that uh, when we take data, we know what magnetic field belongs to the sun and what, what component belongs to the actual spacecraft. Voyager 1 is now 120 times as far from the sun as the Earth is. That means it's 11 billion miles out, and Voyager 2 is 9 billion miles out. They're very near the edge of the bubble the sun creates around itself called the heliosphere. We're getting very close to the boundary. We don't know how close because no spacecraft has ever been there before. But it could be another few months, it could be another few years, but it's probably not much longer than that. We travel a billion miles every three years. You can't see the bubble the sun creates around itself because it's invisible, but we can see an analog of it in a sink. If we turn the water on very fast and look at the bottom of the sink, we see that near where the water hits the bottom of the sink, it's flowing very fast radially outward in all directions and getting thinner until it abruptly slows down in this thick region and turns around and flows down the drain. 
The two Voyager spacecraft are both in this thick region in our heliosphere where the wind has slowed down and is turning to go down the tail of the heliosphere. And eventually, within the, uh, we hope in not too many more years, Voyager 1 will leave this thick region and enter interstellar space. It's really remarkable. We have a 20-watt transmitter on the spacecraft transmitting over 11 billion miles away. And so it comes in very slowly. But every bit left that spacecraft over 16 hours ago. Every bit is telling us something new that we haven't known before. As we leave the Edward Stone School, we will be going up Highway 61 to the north and turning on West Avenue, just past the Notre Dame High School. The Notre Dame High School is a private Roman Catholic high school in Burlington, Iowa. It is located in the Roman Catholic Diocese of Davenport. Notre Dame opened in 1957 in its current location. The original school was at Corton High and was built in 1877 for about $20,000. Continue our tour eastbound on West Avenue to Perkins Park. Perkins Park is an 18-acre tract. The park was part of the Perkins estate. It was given to the city of Burlington in 1927 to be used as a public park. The land which was purchased by Mr. Charles Elliott Perkins past president of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad in 1867 was the site of his home, the Apple Tree. This home was enlarged to 28 rooms mansion over time. This park includes a shelter house, a gazebo, playground, tennis courts, and several attractive footbridges. We leave Perkins Park on our way northbound to 815 South Garfield the Coulter House. 815 Garfield, a beautiful Victorian home, is located on the corner of West and Garfield. It was built in 1897 by John Coulter, president and treasurer of Burlington School Furniture Company. This home boasts high ceilings, stunning woodwork, parquet floors, pocket doors, beautiful stained glass, three wood burning fireplaces, a wraparound deck for outdoor entertainment, and an uh, updated kitchen, all updated electric and plumbing, and Morel original brass chandeliers have all been converted from gas to electric. Next to 815 South Garfield, the Coulter House is 809 South Garfield, where Milton and Ann Blau lived from 1915 to 1963. Milton Blau was president of John Blau's and Sons Company. They were major wholesale distributors of food in the early and mid-1900s. In the mid-1900s, their company became one of the Midwest's largest distributor of home roasted coffee. They could produce 400 pounds of roasted coffee in 20 minutes. Farther north on Garfield at 625 South Garfield is Charles Tegger's house. The Tagers came here in the 1900s. He became a well-known wholesale liquor distributor. He was a quiet man, but a great supporter of Burlington community. A single-family home that contains 3,198 square feet and was built in 1868. It contains four bedrooms and two baths. Next door to the north is 615 Garfield, the Kessel House. This house had three different house numbers, 613, 625, and 617, on two different streets, Warren and Garfield. It is a four-square house with a side portico, four bedrooms, one and a half baths, 2,198 square feet. We think it was built in 1910. The original family is still a mystery. We feel one of the families that lived in this house was involved with the Iowa Soap Company. Continue northbound to the uh, Morehouse house at 523 South Garfield. William Henry Morehouse was born January the 10th, 1832 in Saratoga County, New York. Married Mrs. Minerva A. MacArthur, 1859. Established the Bank of Brookings, Brookings, South Dakota. He was a Mason, 
died June the 17th, 1907, at the home of Fetic Hospital. The 523 South Garfield Morehouse house has been lovingly restored to a high Victorian style inside. We leave 523 South Garfield, the Morehouse, and moved west or north and then east to 701 Division Street, the W.F. Hayden House. 701 Division Street, the W.F. Hayden House, is a beautiful craftsman arts and crafts style home. Mr. Hayden and Mr. Stewart partnered in a plumbers and steam fitters business. They had a wholesale slash retail business at 312 North Main. The Hayden House is a single family home that contains 3,411 square feet and was built in 1860. It contains four bedrooms and a bath. We will be leaving 701 Division Street, moving east to the riverfront and Memorial Auditorium. The Memorial Auditorium, a rich history of live entertainment, Burlington Memorial Auditorium, located uh, on Front Street along Mississippi River, was opened to the public in May of 1939. Built by the Works Progress Administration and first used as a U.S. Naval Reserve Training Center and by the Supply Company of the 136th Medical Regiment of the Iowa National Guard. This building was the home to a naval training unit for Corsairs. There were six Navy planes allocated to this unit for four, 205 flight officers. This was also home for a Naval Training Electronics Unit. Six million dollars was invested to train 200 enlisted reserve. They were trained in radio, radar, and electronics repair. It is a unique historic venue for live concerts, musicals, and sports events with a 6,000 square foot flat floor area theoretical stage with a full grid professional lighting and sound and 1,200 permanent seats in the upper and lower balconies. The lower level has a complete kitchen and three banquet rooms for weddings, parties, meetings, etc.